For all of you watching, want to thank you for joining us. I'm Melissa with the Reagan Foundation, joined, of course, uh, with Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Carlos Lozada. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can see it on my screen, but holding up a copy of his book, The Washington Book, uh, which is a, a really um, uh, interesting and great read. And so we're going to talk about that today. Um, and I guess my first question um, maybe is for people who are not familiar really with the book. So if you don't know what this book is yet, it's a collection of essays, I think from the last decade that Carlos has written. And I actually wondered, Carlos, as you were grouping them together in sort of different chapters and sort of putting the book together, do you think it changed the meaning of any of the original essay essays by putting them in, into these specific groups? It's a great question. I think that um, for me, um, it, it may have changed a little bit of how I think of them when I when I look back and read, right? Um, I generally don't like to look back on things that I've written, whether a decade ago or a week ago, because I can always think of like, oh, I should have changed that verb or like I could have written that more sharply. Um, but um, but here it kind of it forced me to really look back and and try to decide what what different essays mean and. Um, or different reviews or different books, right? And so if I choose to put um, Jim Comey's memoir into um, my, you know, Jim Comey, the, the former FBI director, um, uh, into the section on leadership versus say the section on political posturing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying, I'm, I'm making a statement, right? And, and I'm having to decide, you know, what what did that book really mean to me? What did I conclude about that book? Yeah. And there may be elements of, of both of those things um, in in my review and in my conception of the of the book and of the piece. But this kind of forced me to decide. So yeah. the the book is divided into six sections. Um, the first is about they're all sort of actions that happen in Washington, right? One is the first section is leading. It's it's books by by presidents and vice presidents and sort of high elected officials. Uh, then comes fighting, which is books about war and foreign policy and national security. Um, you know, there's a section called belonging, which are books about all the battles over over identity um, and um, books about about um, enduring, which is sort of like, you know, the the American democratic experiment books about posing, which happens a lot in Washington. And finally, imagining, which um, is sort of um, books that try to explore um, sort of high, you know, high concept ideas about about America, about the American experiment and about Washington. And so kind of those are real categories, but also artificial because a lot of the books do many things at once. And so this forces me to decide what what one author or one political figure um, really meant, um, both through that person's book, but also what that person meant to me. And so that's actually leads that perfectly. You're talking about it's a book that you where you had to decide, right, wh what these essays meant and where they belonged. You have this book covers 10 years of essays. How did you even begin to determine which essays would make it into the book and which ones wouldn't? Yes. Um, so the you know, it's funny, the, the book either took me 10 years to write because that's how long <laughs> it took these pieces, or it took me one year to write. Um, uh, in February of last year, I um, I delivered a lecture at my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame, um, uh, the the Red Smith Lecture in Journalism. It's this annual annual address, and I look back to see what past people had done. I was very honored, you know. I love going back to to visit my my school, and I look back to see what what um, what prior speakers had had done, and I noticed that they started doing the they they focused on like that one thing that they do and that they do best and kind of explaining why they do it and how they do it. So when Tim Russert, the late Tim Russert, delivered the Red Smith lecture in 2007 or eight, he um he explained how he prepares to interview politicians, right? When um when David Remnick um uh, gave the Red Smith lecture, he talked about how um, he had just written a biography of Muhammad Ali. So he talked about how Muhammad Ali changed sports journalism forever. Right. So I was thinking, like, what am I going to do? You know, and um, and I realized, oh, well, I should talk about reading political books and why I think there's a value there, even when so many people sort of denigrate often, you know, the 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 political memoir genre. Um, 
And so that forced me to go back and read years worth of of my own stuff. As I as I mentioned, you know, it, it's it's um it's a discomforting enterprise to go back and sort of look at your own at your own writing. Um, and it was really hard to decide, um, you know, what would make it into a book because I wasn't really even thinking of the book. I was just thinking like, what can I distill into an essay and into, into a speech? I mean, um, to talk about political understanding politics through through books and through literature. Um, and so I started drawing from different moments and different essays and different ideas and different anecdotes and to put it together into a speech. And it was at that moment after I delivered it that I thought, you know what? This sounds like the introduction to a collection. Mm. Um, and but there's I could have written a book that was twice as long because, you know, there's just been a lot that I've written over the past decade. And there had to be a kind of ruthlessness to that process. Um, once I came up with those six categories, there were things that just didn't fit. And as much as I was, you know, um, in love with a particular piece, it just didn't make sense. Um, and um, and so it was a process of, of sort of my own culling and also working with um, with my editor uh, at, at Simon and Schuster, who would tell me that, you know, like, this is a good essay, but it just doesn't make sense in this collection. So let's get rid of it. Um, there's a few that I still wish I could have snuck in um, <laughs> that, that, will, that will always, always be regrets. Um, but I think that that discipline is important because you want you don't want anything in there that just feels like filler or extra or unnecessary. You want all of them to tell a story together. And speaking of that story, what are you hoping the reader takes away from your book when they're done? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny when when people um, learn that this is how I make a living, right, that I that I read political memoirs and government reports and congressional investigations and special counsel reports and the rest, you know, they um they always say something like, um, thank you so much for reading those books so that we don't have to. <laughs> um, and the implication of that is that, you know, well, there might be some value there, but really these books are kind of dull or they're propagandistic, you know, they're ghost written or they're kind of dry policy tomes. Um, and so that reading them must be a drag, right? I, I wrote an earlier book um, called What Were We Thinking about the sort of the intellectual landscape of the Trump era in, in American politics. And I read about 150 books um, that informed that book. And when I was working at the Washington Post at the time, now now I'm at the New York Times, and um, the reviewer for the Times reviewed the book. He liked the book, but he said that my reading all those books was an act of transcendent masochism. Um, <laughs> that, that was his his uh, his evaluation of what it must be like to read political books. But I'm a big believer in in Washington books. You asked me like what what I think readers can can take away. You know, I I find that even in these books where political figures are trying to sanitize their records and their lives sometimes or trying to present themselves in the most confirmable and electable and favorable light, they often end up revealing themselves. Um, you know, it's not always the newsiest, sexiest stuff that, you know, political reporters say, here's the five takeaways from the new Obama memoir or something like that. It's often little things, right? It's a it's a phrase that Kamala Harris uses a little too often. Right. It's something that Vladimir Putin wrote 20 years ago in a in, in a or, or 25 years ago in a in a in a book he published. It's it's the way that Mike Pence quotes something that Donald Trump says, but skips a little bit of the of the quote. You know, it's little things like that that I find um, incredibly revelatory about someone's values and someone's politics. Um, and so I think that that. Um, you know, that's what I try to do in this book is try to sort of unveil political figures and political moments and political eras um, through writing. It's not the only way. It's it's my way, you know, to do it through a very close reading of books and documents. There's a lot of political reporters who do it in other ways. And God bless. You know, I, I, I read them very carefully. Um, but for me, it's been um, a real treat to be able to to try to treat Washington as this one long text that I am slowly decoding. Hmm. Now, you said earlier that your book has six sections, and one of the sections is on leadership. Um, 
Do you think that there's a leadership how-to guide in reading your book, or do you think maybe there is a quality or qualities that sort of transcend across all the people you covered in your leadership section? Oh, wow, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so the people that I cover in the leadership section um, range from, um, you know, George H.W. Bush to Barack Obama, to Dick Cheney, to Hillary Clinton, to Donald Trump, to Kamala Harris, to Mike Pence. Um, they're all very different types of figures. Um, and um, I think that um, this is going to sound a little a little trite, perhaps, but um, but, you know, people are often um, skeptical of, of political figures in, in, in one way where they say like, oh, they're they're a bunch of liars. Right. Or or they're just spinning or they're not telling the truth in 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 various ways. And so you can devolve into a kind of gotcha exercise, um, you know, reading these books and sort of identify little moments. Um, but it's 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 much less that right it's it's more kind of like things that they not just things they say but also things they left they they leave unsaid right and so when i think about leadership you know i i think that that if there's one thing that people often thirst for um it's it's um it's some sense of like directness and honesty from from their politicians um the the difficulty with that is that at the same time, um, uh, you know, um, in in a country that's so that's so polarized, you also kind of want your leader to be um, one hundred percent like on board with your worldview, right? And any small um, deviation from that um, makes them. Uh, Sort of anathema to to your side, right? Because there, we're, we're we're like in camps now, um, and so I think the the leadership challenge is to both be honest with voters, with constituents, with whoever might be reading the political memoir or or story that you're telling, um, and at the same time um, fulfill you know the the your own political mandate to try to win elections and stay in office. And those things come into tension. Those things come into tension. And and I think the leaders who stand the test of time are those who who know where they fall on that trade off. Right. And who are able to, um, you know, err on the side of honesty, even at a high political cost. Um, and that's harder and harder today. Huh. Have you been able to meet any of the leaders that you cover in your book? <laughs> um, so I was I was a book critic at the Washington Post for seven years um, before moving to the New York Times in 2022, um, and I've continued writing about political books um, in my job at the Times as a as a columnist. Um, and sort of rule number one is you know do not meet or hang out with the people whose books you're reviewing because. Um, you you know uh, the more you get to know them, the more conflicted you are out of being able to review them. And so I try very hard to not get to know um, anyone that I'm going to be to be writing about. Um, so I'm thinking like, who have I met that um, that I have written about? If I ever have, it's almost always after the fact and okay. and usually in a in a sort of like group collective setting. Um, I always laugh when people who interview me about this book say like, oh, you know, Washington insider, like, but I, I very much try to avoid getting to know them. And once I do, then I can't write about them anymore. That's yeah. the, you know, and that's, that's something I, I, I want to avoid. Um, people often reach out to me trying to pitch their book, you yeah. know, or, or their agent does, or their publisher does. Um, and I try to keep that, that distance, um, and I often tell them, like, you know, no, I don't want to have coffee with you because I might <laughs> like you or I might dislike you. And then I can't write about you anymore. So that actually that answer actually leads perfectly into my next question. Literally, um, you know, you're a columnist, you're trying to cover these books, but you're reading. I think you said one of your books, you read like 150 books on a single topic. And so it, sometimes it must just seem like 
mudslinging. One book is, you know, pro this, the other book is anti this, and then pro this and anti this. How do you find your way as the columnist, as the writer, to absorb it all and try and say, you know, sort of nonpartisan and in the middle as you're then writing your essay about what those books are about? Right. Um, I would say first that it's not like I aim for the middle. I sort of aim for whatever is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And and what is interesting may the 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 politics of it may shift from one book to another, right? Um, I try to keep my own politics out of it, but I go to whatever is is sort of most um, most appealing and most revelatory. And maybe that revelation, you know, is is either very positive toward the the author or very negative toward the author. Um, and that's just the way the way it works out. Once I find those things, I can't not write about them, you know. Yeah. So, um, but I'll give you a good example um, from actually this is not even from the book because this is more recent. Um, uh, Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, mm -hmm. wrote this memoir recently that got a ton of attention because she revealed that she had um, you know shot and killed uh, sort of this unruly dog. Um, that she had, and also uh, an, a sort of annoying goat as well. Um, and and so I wasn't planning to read Christine Noem's book. I thought like if she becomes Donald Trump's vice presidential running mate um, later this summer, then then maybe I'll I'll read the book then. That's what I did with Biden as well. I kind of waited to see who he would choose. Um, and then when it was Kamala Harris, I, I, I read her book right away and, and wrote about it. So I figured there's like maybe a one in five or one in six shot that I'll that I'll read Christy Nome's book. Of course, then this huge story broke. Um, and I felt like I had to, like people were expecting me to read it. I even heard from colleagues saying like, so are you gonna read Nome? You're gonna read Nome? Um, but my challenge is that, well, well, everyone knows this story now. I'm not sort of bringing a lot that's novel to, to, the, um, to the table, but I decided to believe in my own my own shtick, my own method, and, and say like, I bet you there'll be something else here that is interesting um, that people haven't focused on. And so I read the book um, and there absolutely was, right? Something something that was sort of very, very interesting to me. And that is this whole story of, of the dog and the goat that's gotten so much attention and seems people think it's torpedoed her chances to be the the veep. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know that one way or the other. Um, but that what was fascinating to me is that that story was sandwiched in the middle of this chapter that she had about her credentials and expertise on foreign policy and national security, right? And so she was trying to show that somehow this indicated the kind of decision maker that she oh. is, right? And so, you know, that to me was was fascinating and and worth writing about um, in and putting that story that everyone had heard, putting it into a bigger Mm -hmm. and and more interesting and revelatory context and that's mm -hmm. that's very much what i what i try to do with 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 everything that i that i write um sometimes i you know i don't i don't know what i'm going to find i don't go into the experience of reading or writing about a book um with any kind of political prior um because chances are i'm going to find something that's far more interesting than whatever my political lens is to it Mm hmm. So speaking of that lens, um, it's a it's a good, good lead in. It's like you knew what my next question was. So, of <laughs> course, you're having this conversation with the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. So I have to bring Ronald Reagan into the mix. So I'm going to read this card. Um, Ronald Reagan once quoted Will Rogers and said, the fellow that can only see a week ahead is a popular fellow for he's looking with the crowd. The great leader, the true leader has a telescope. So my question to you is, do you agree with that? And if so, of the leaders you've researched, who do you think has a telescope? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of leaders have telescopes. I think um, the big question is where the telescope is pointing, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and but, but I, I like that quote very much. I hadn't, I hadn't heard it before. Um, uh, you know, one, and, and this actually speaks to, to, um, to Reagan for reasons that will be obvious. Um, one leader that I was surprised by, um, once I read all his books was George H. W. Bush. Mm -hmm. And the, in fact, the, the first chapter in, in, in the Washington book is, is a lengthy essay about George H. W. Bush's own books. Um, he never wrote a real memoir. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he kind of danced around it. He had a kind of a, one of those campaign memoirs that's ghost written. He um, he published his his diary from his time as the as the U.S. envoy to China. He published a wonderful book of letters um, called All the Best, George Bush. And he co-wrote a book with Brent Scowcroft where they just kind of took turns reminiscing about, you know, different different aspects of, of foreign policy in their time. But never like a real honest to goodness, sit down and think through your life memoir. Um, and I, I really wish he had. And the the reason that the the telescope um, metaphor um, feels apropos to me is that, you know, I think we all remember one thing that he would get dinged for is that he, quote unquote, lacked the vision thing. Right. That's uh, that's something that that um, even he, you know, he was annoyed by that critique, but kind of understood it. Sometimes he felt that he couldn't boil things down to a bumper sticker and he 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 struggled with that. But reading his books, what I came to realize is that part of why that was difficult for him is is because rather than having a very particular vision of what the world should look like, um, especially, you know, in matters of foreign policy and the like, having having a very particular vision of of um, of, you know, what the post Cold War world, for instance, should be. His primary focus was that whatever it was like, America needed to be in charge, right? Mm -hmm. America needed to, um, you know, have a significant leadership role. Like what was interesting to me um, in his diary entries about, say, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, is that, you know, he felt like, look, OK, we've we've licked the Vietnam syndrome. That's over. And, you know, if this works well, then we would have reaffirmed America's leadership role. Right. And that was his end. Right. That was that was the vision that he had. It was a vision of America you know, working with other with other countries and with allies, of course, but but very much, you know, keeping America in charge to what particular end to what, part, you know, what would that look like? It didn't seem to matter as much as just being there. And and he felt also that, um, you know, we need a kind of leader who can do that. Gee, I wonder who that will be, George. You know, it was, it was you know, he, he very much saw himself in that role. But so so I you know, one thing I I write in the piece is that he did have a vision you just need to look in the mirror to find it, right? The vision yeah. was America needs to be in leadership in the world. I'm the person who can do that. Um, and so that was, to me, that was what he saw in the mirror. And that's what he saw through the telescope. Hmm. We're uh, doing a, an event in a month or so with Jean Becker on her latest book on H.W. Bush's character. Um, oh, so tied to that. Um, but you, so you're talking about um, America and its leadership amongst nations. So my last Ronald Reagan quote I'm going to read. Um, he once said, our commitment to civility and the proper discourse between nations should never waver. So you've read all these biographies. Um, have you learned lessons about civility between people and between nations? Um, have you gleaned anything about that that you could share as wisdom? Yeah. Um... It's interesting, you know, when people, when political scientists or sometimes journalists, you know, write about relations among nations, it's often these, you know, big systemic forces, right? That, you know, this ideology clashes with that ideology um, or, you know, it's a battle for resources and all the rest. When politicians talk about it, um, it's almost invariably um, their one-on-one -on -one relationships with other leaders, right? Um, and that kind of personalized uh, foreign policy, right? International relations through one-on-one -on -one is something that um, that so many leaders uh, focus on and write about and think they're uniquely suited to do, um, even if they aren't always, right? Um, it's funny speaking speaking of George H. W. You know, like he he regrets, for instance, in one of these books that you know he was never as close to Margaret Thatcher as Ronald Reagan was. Um, you know, and he wished he had that relationship. He, he thought that could have been important. Right. But he was very appreciative of, of his relationship with with Mikhail Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. You know, like that mattered a lot to him. Um, and so, you know, um, Biden today is 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 similar. You know, he cares a lot about his one on one connections with 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 leaders. Um, 
And, you know, there's a certain, I don't know if, you know, calling it arrogance is right, um, but a certain confidence, right? That, um, that if I can just get in a room with so-and-so, you right. know, we can hammer something out. Um, and that's not always how it works. Um, but but I I found that as a as very much a a recurring theme in in a lot of the 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 books that I read, especially you know buying about you know political figures, is that there's that that sense of you know I have a unique ability to um, project a certain kind of leadership and forge a certain kind of relationship. Obama was like that very much as well. You know, Obama felt like well my background um, will allow me to improve you know U.S. relations. With the Arab world, right, um, or or with the with the Muslim world, and um, and that wasn't you know necessarily the case. You know, there there's um, I think it takes a certain kind of um, of uh, you know distilled self confidence to feel you can be the American president, right? In, in general, um, and I think that that comes across in the way that they they think about about America's leadership in the world. It's often kind of through their own personas. Mm hmm. So you just mentioned um, President Obama um, in one of the essays that you have in the book. You talk about how his presidency was less about democratic values than it was about Obama himself. Can you talk about what you meant by that? Sure. Um, you know, what was interesting to me, you may remember um, early um, either in, during the transition period after he won the presidency. Um, uh, he was starting to name sort of who would be his his big cabinet members, right? Who would be Secretary of State or who would be, you know, all these different figures. And people were were questioning, like, hey, you promised all this hope and change, but it's just a bunch of old Clinton administration officials, right? Like, why, you know, where's the change? And the answer was, I'm the change, hmm. right? The answer was, you know, like, it's basically it's me. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the new vision. I'm the new... I'm the personification of everything that I'm, that I'm, you know, um, uh, you know, bringing bringing forward for the country, and I found that in in many ways throughout his presidency, the way he would talk about, like I said, relations with the Muslim world, the way he would talk about the state of race relations in the United States, the way he would talk about about war, national security, it was often with this sort of very self-referential. Uh, framework. Um, Obama, um, you know, and it's no surprise, you know, um, his own political fortunes were better than those of the Democratic Party um, during his his tenure. Um, you know, it's almost like these were sort of two very separate entities. Um, and what, you know, and and so that's, you know, I, I, I that essay is called the the self-referential presidency of, of Barack Obama. Um, and I wrote it sort of right as he was leaving office, sort of in the in the transition, you know, after after the election, he was still president, but before the inauguration of of Donald Trump. Um, and and, you know, the the origin of that of that piece is that is as, as often happens is I was reading another book, you know, by um, Michael Eric Dyson, who was writing about. Obama and the black presidency and what that presidency meant for for black America. And there's a moment when Dyson criticizes Obama um, or just reflects on Obama and says, you know, he thinks that because he's made this kind of progress in his own life that somehow all black Americans are are, are sharing in it. And that's just not true. Um, and it just kind of hit me in that moment, like, oh, he does that about a lot of different things, not just on race. Um, and I even wrote like, is that fodder for a bigger essay someday? You know, and because it was like a year or two before I, I wrote that, um, and that's often kind of where the ideas for you know for what I'm going to write comes from. It's some you know you tie things together from lots of different sources, um, and once I had that lens through which to understand him, um, a sort of whole different version of Obama appeared before my my eyes, and it seemed like one that was worth worth writing about. And of course, mm -hmm. he then handed the presidency. Um, he did not expect to hand the presidency to Donald Trump, but he handed it to to someone who um, who is perhaps even more um, personalized in the sense of like, you know, I alone can fix it kind of um, kind of approach to to governing. So there's some connective tissue there, um, even if they're obviously incredibly different figures and um, and with incredibly different impact on on the conduct of American democracy. Mm hmm. Um, 
as you go through and read the different um, essays on the different leaders, you have one on Dick Cheney. Um, and if I recall correctly, you call him exceptional. Um, and I was curious if you could explain why you used that word. That's also the title of the book that I was writing about, which he co-wrote with his daughter, Liz Cheney. Um, and uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking um, now, uh, sort of in the last few weeks, I've been reading books about about American exceptionalism, sort of as a as a historical mm -hmm. concept, um, and um, and Dick Cheney and and Liz Cheney, they 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 co-wrote this book. You know, they they were very much on board with the concept of American exceptionalism, but a a version of it a, a version of it that I found um, uh, a little simple, a little a little. Um, um, you know, just kind of like skip over whatever parts of American history seem inconvenient, um, focus on on the sort of like triumphant, successful narrative um, and um, and use it as a cudgel to attack Barack Obama um, was sort of what that what that book was was about. And, you know, I felt that that sort of um, the the narrative of of that book um, felt like it it sort of held less purchase and less sway, I thought, um, than, than perhaps earlier um, when Dick Cheney was a far more kind of influential and powerful figure in the party. Um, and so I sort of end that piece with that, that, that line that you, you highlighted that, you know, I feel he's exceptional um, in the context of the, of the essay. Um, I think it, it, it becomes apparent that what I mean is that he's, Kind of an outlier in this yeah. in this in this vision that he's that he's presenting um of course i did not imagine at the time because this was maybe nine or ten years ago when that book was out um that that liz cheney you know the the co-author um would become such a vital uh yeah. figure in in the battles within the republican party um and the political and democratic battles uh writ large um, of the of the moment, I feel like I should go back and I I read the January six report, you know, which he was clearly very very involved in. But I feel like I should go back and reread that book and see what I can glean about about Liz Cheney's sure. worldview, um, which I think would be would be a lot of fun right now to do. Interesting. We had her here, gosh, twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two. It was uh, probably our most attended event we oh, had, I, I, and I can't remember how long. Um, now, you also had an essay on Hillary Clinton, um, and your essay title made me giggle. It was How to Hate Hillary Clinton, Especially If You Already Do. Um, and in the essay, you talk about some of her shortcomings, but um, what I really found interesting is that you talk about that many of the things she's berated for has nothing to actually do with who she is as a person. It has to do with the fact that she's female and that if she was male and she used that kind of language or dressed the way she dressed as a male, she would have been left alone. And it made me wonder if in all these books that you read, if that's a common thread, do you find that you know men are looked at as strong and women are looked at as stubborn? Um, do you see that kind of thread come across in the different books you read? I mean, I think that's something you see um... Something I see not just in the books I read, but just you know being a being a sentient human being walking walking the earth, right? The uh, and 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 certainly in Washington, um, you know, there's this, and you see this with Kamala Harris. People talk about her laugh, right? Mm. Well, and 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 they use the same word that they often used for Hillary Clinton's laugh, which is cackle, mm -hmm. right? I never, I I don't think I've ever heard a male politician's laugh being deconstructed in the same way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and so, you know, and and that's just, that's a very minor example mm -hmm. of um, ways in which, in which female politicians are, are held to different standards. Um, and, you know, not just sort of like things about their appearance or their attire, um, the way they smile not often enough, the way they laugh too loudly or not enough. Um, you know, it's it's a whole sort of additional load of issues that female politicians have to deal with. Um, the the challenge for Hillary Clinton was also that she came, um, you know, into her own in America, you know, just given given like her age and, you know, she she was someone who always was posing these big generational challenges, right? She delivered mm 
you know, when she graduated from Wellesley, she delivered this famous address that kind of put her on the map. When she became first lady, you know, I think she was the first first lady with a graduate degree. And she had that famous moment which says, you know, I'm not going to just like stay home and have, you know, teas and cookies and the rest. Um, and so I think for a long time, um, she generated, and this is part of what I write about in that piece, she generated such animosity in certain segments of the right that by the time she ran for president, um, both in 08 and then again in 2016, um, there was a whole generation of certain kinds of, you know, um, you know, right wing talk radio listeners and others who had just been essentially, you know, trained for a couple of decades to hate Hillary Clinton. Um, and that's why I um, I think, as you mentioned, that the title of that piece was how to hate Hillary Clinton, especially if you already do, mm -hmm. um, because that that piece covers maybe four or five books that are these kind of very, um, you know, predictable and um, and relentless attacks on kind of all aspects of of her um, in ways that even it's it's funny, they um, they they sort of contradict each other, you know, like Hillary did this in Benghazi, you know, because she was trying to, you know, she covered up Benghazi because she was trying to sort of save some corrupt deals she has in that part of the world. Or she covered up Benghazi because she actually, you know, it was sympathetic to terrorism or like, you know, it didn't matter what the motivation was as long as the 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 purported motivation, as long as the um, uh, the outcome was always sort of very insidious. Um, and so there were plenty of I'm, I'm you know, I I'm not a, 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 um, a campaign guru, one of these people who like advises candidates. Um, I think there were plenty of self-inflicted wounds in the Hillary Clinton presidential campaigns. Um, but there were also many reasons that I think contributed to her defeat that had nothing to do with her qualifications or her experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you also had a handful of essays in your book about Donald Trump. Um, and you uh, write about, you read all 2,212 pages of books written about him. Um, and I'm going to quote by you. Him. you uh, by him. By him and, yes. um, so you, this is a quote from your book. You wrote, um, um, I encountered a world where bragging is breathing and insulting is talking, where repetition and contradiction come standard, where vengefulness and insecurity erupt at random. But now you also in those essays said you had respect for um, Donald Trump. So I'm curious after, you know, reading all those different books and sort of, you know, watching him on the news or whatever that may be, how would you actually define his leadership style? Oh, wow. Um, the, what was interesting to me is like, so those were, that was a piece I wrote when he was first running for the presidency in 2015. It was summer of 2015 and he was just starting to do well in the polls. And so I, I asked my editor, like, you know, I should, what if I just read a bunch of his books, you know, cause he's, he's published several, he hasn't really written them, but he's published them. And even <laughs> ghostwritten books are revealing about how someone wishes to be perceived. So they still tell you a lot. Um, what if I just read, you know, a handful of them? I read eight of them, uh, and see what what it says about this guy, right? What what I learn. Um, and the funny thing is, my editor said, um, "Great idea, go ahead, but hurry up. Who knows how long interest is going to last?" Um, and that was summer 2015. Um, and what was remarkable to me is that, you know, and it's not that I was very sage and sort of foresaw the future. I, I didn't. I just sort of read what was in the books. And so much of what we've seen about how he leads was already apparent in um, in the art of the deal and the art of the comeback and surviving at the top and you know crippled America and all these all these different books that he that he published. Um, uh, the the respect that I expressed at that moment in summer 2015 was just kind of the the sheer chutzpah that he kind of brought to to politics the way he would. He, he managed to say things that were both um, um, perhaps untrue, but that got to how certain people felt. Um, and he forged a very visceral connection with, um, with his supporters. And I think that um, uh, sort of shamelessness in, in kind of playing to the crowd at every moment um, 
is one of the, I think, more defining aspects of, of his leadership style. Even the build the wall, it's not that he was so committed to it. It's that he realized that whenever he said it, it got a great reaction and people loved it. So he stuck with it and it became one of the defining aspects of his of his presidency, even if the wall itself was not built. Um, and so, you know, that that uh, that talent in forging that intense visceral connection with followers, I think, is perhaps um, one of the most significant aspects of of his his leadership style. Um, he also had the benefit um, of um, having been on a reality television show mm -hmm. for many years leading up to that campaign, which gave people a very specific vision of him as this, you know, great business leader that didn't necessarily match up with, you know, with the fact set about about how his companies had done. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that without The Apprentice, there's no Donald Trump presidency, right, that that so many people already, you know, and, and this can this links up with that idea about about the connection he's able to forge, people felt like they knew him so well, you know, from this persona that he played on television. Um, and so it was in a, in a sense easier for him to to build that connection when they already felt like, oh, I know this guy, you know, he's been on my TV, you know, once a week for years. And I, um, I already feel that he's, um, you know, he's this tough, smart, successful businessman. Um, and he leaned into that, you know, and that, that became the, you know, he was playing a persona on The Apprentice. He was kind of playing a persona on the campaign trail as well. Um, so anyway, I think to, to me, that's the most um, uh, notable thing about his leadership. Like, you know, even other politicians, maybe Bill Clinton had that a little bit. He could really connect with people. Um, Biden to some extent, but it's it's very difficult to see someone who has forged that kind of intimate connection, um, uh, like no matter what kind of connection with with um, with voters and with supporters like like Donald Trump has. Mm -hmm. um, now, as we talked about earlier, of course, not all the essays are on leadership. Um, you talked about um, some being on war, and there was a um, essay on 9/11 that I think had the most profound for me, most profound statement in it. Um, it said, "Al Qaeda could not dim the promise of America; only we could do that to ourselves." Um, can you talk about that? Yeah. Um... You know, that was, um, I believe that moment in the essay, I was reflecting on what George W. Bush had said in his address to the nation from the Oval Office following 9-11. Um, and, you know, what was, what was um, again, this was a case where I didn't really know what I was going to say. I knew I wanted to write something for the 20th anniversary of the attacks. And so I decided I would kind of dip into some of the best books written about, about that, both the the run up to 9/11 the events of the day the reaction the wars that followed you know kind of looking at the at the totality um of it and so i read like 20 21 books um on it and some of them were you know just i'm i'm so glad i did that i'm glad i had a patient an, an editor with the patience to let me do it mm -hmm. um but um what i found is that there was this sort of contradiction at the heart of of um of 9-11 and of our response to 9-11. And that is, you know, the one thing that President Bush and 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 a lot of politicians said at the time was, you know, they um they hate us for our values. They attacked us for our values, for 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 who we are. Um and yet I I feel that, you know, what I concluded after after reading all these volumes is that so much of our response to 9-11 um, in some ways undermined those, those very values. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, you know, entering into endless war, one of, one of which was, was under, under, under pretenses that did not hold up. Um, you know, um, Guantanamo Bay, enhanced interrogations, quote unquote, all these things were, were in, in some ways, um, rejections of American values um and um what what it what it highlighted for me is you know what we do when we create exceptions 
to norms and rules, right? Like it's easy to follow our self-imposed norms and rules and values um, during simple, uncomplicated times, right? They exist precisely for the difficult moments, right? But we tell ourselves like, well, we're gonna we're gonna loosen certain restrictions or we're going to um, you know, not live up to certain values because we um because it's an emergency, because you know, this is a very serious time. And it's very difficult to not succumb to that. Um, but I think our response to 9-11 um did not uphold many of the values that uh, we said were the very reason why we were attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, it's funny, I, I I spent so many months reading those books and and writing that piece. I think it's it's the longest single chapter in this book. Um, uh, and yet, you know, all that kind of just takes me to something very simple like that, something that one idea that I, the years later, I know that's the one way I'm going to remember um, that period and that experience of, of of reading those books. And that's kind of why I do it. It's not just so I can like tell you or tell readers kind of what I think. It's so I can figure out what I think. Hmm. Um, I didn't have that going. I didn't have that idea going in sort of after this, you know, after putting myself through through all those volumes, that's what I ended up with, you know, and and that's sort of the the approach I take in the book. I, I dive into a subject that I'm interested in. I read a lot about it and I'm hoping, God, I'm hoping that I will find something there that is worth holding up to the light. Um, <laughs> and and that's um, that's the approach. And uh, that's that's what I um, I really I'm glad I was able to do in, in that particular instance. Hmm. Well, speaking about, you know, leaning in when you read now, this may not be a fair question, so feel free to not have an answer. But you have essays on, you know, Russia and Ukraine and China. Um, and it made me wonder if in all of your readings, have you come away with a sense of what America may need to do to sort of prevent some of these wars? Oh, you know, um, if I if I knew that, I would. Um, I would be, you know, working on the NSC or something um, <laughs> rather than rather than being a, a book critic or columnist for a for a for a newspaper. Um, what I have found is that there is like, you know, I, I, I mentioned the Iraq war, for instance, um, in all these books, it's hard to identify the moment when the decision was made to go to war. It's easy to find moments when the decision has already been made, but not necessarily the moment when it was made. Um, and there've been excellent books on the Bush presidency, on on the decision to go to war. My colleague at the Times, Robert Draper, wrote wrote, wrote a very good one. Um, but um, but it, it almost felt like it was something that there was this weird sense of inevitability to it. Um, and and you know, those moments when like that ship had sailed and I, I find that in, in reading some of these books, for instance, I there's been a lot of talk about whether the United States and China are in some kind of collision course for for conflict. And I was both, you know, curious and concerned about that. And so I decided to read like a half dozen books that dealt with that subject in different ways from very different perspectives, academics, policy practitioners, novelists, you know, all these all these different vantage points. And what was interesting to me is that I found, for instance, that some authors were saying, look, China is inevitably, you know, going to overtake America as a new superpower. And in those imbalances, when you have, you know, an ascendant power and a declining power, you get conflict, right? And if you look historically, that's how it happens, right? Then you have another author that says, actually, China is on the decline, you know, demographically, economically, um, you know, but precisely because they're declining, um, you know, they are going to want to seize the moment now while they still can to exert their power in the world. Right. And so and that's why you're going to get a conflict. And so it was amazing to me, right, that two authors with completely different reads on the current state of Chinese power and Chinese development. You know, one says it's ascendant, one says it's plummeting. <laughs> they both say there's going to be conflict, right? And 
I feel that once you've decided that there's going to be conflict, almost any set of circumstances can justify that belief. Um, and I feel that that may have been part of what was happening with with Iraq, um, um, even though that's that's very hard to to pinpoint. Um, but I feel that so much of Washington has kind of geared up for this this sort of inevitable notion of um, of a of a of a showdown with China. So I don't know how to prevent such things, um, but I do think that you know questioning those kinds of assumptions. Um, um, you know, trying to figure out where these priors come from um, and realizing that, you know, maybe I've predetermined an outcome and I'm just grabbing any circumstances to justify that outcome um, is both very dangerous and extremely tempting and extremely common. Um, and so that, I think, is just something to to look out for as, you know, whether you're a a politician, you know, an advisor um, a military advisor, a political advisor, um, uh, a lawmaker, um, because you get these momentum, you know, these these like these these balls start rolling in certain directions, um, and it's very hard to to slow them down. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you for that. I only have uh, two final questions. Hopefully, they're not too hard. Um, you say in your book that when you became an American citizen in 2014, as part of your preparation, you chose to read Democracy in America. And I'm curious if um, now here you are in 2024, 10 years later, you've read all these different other books. Would you still choose that book to read or maybe would you choose something different? Oh, wow. Uh, I think it was a very useful book to read at the time. First, I was ashamed that I'd never read it, right? It's it's a book that everyone quotes and maybe not everyone reads, um, but I didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to actually have, have, have read it. So I chose the moment, sort of that year after I became an American citizen to read, to read Democracy in America. Um, I found it incredibly useful. There were, there were some moments that, um, that were so, um, uh, even though it was written like the 1830s or so, um, that it felt like they were written for like today, you know? Okay. Uh, Tocqueville talks about how America is a place that seems to lose its mind every presidential election cycle. Um, um, he talked about the the kind of um, somewhere between annoying and endearing, um, you know, uh, expressions of overt patriotism by Americans at all times, you know, and I, I thought of the, you know, USA, USA chant. Um, and, um, and of course, he talked about the sort of relentless urge to join things, right? The, 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 the pull of associational life uh, in, in American society, um, which I had experienced as a, when, when I came to college here in the United States, um, I went to, to Notre Dame. Um, and um, you know, good good Catholic school, good Catholic boy had to go to go to Notre Dame, and I was I was struck by how you know, oh, do I join the Hispanic American Students Organization or the International Students Organization? Very different. They don't really get along, you know. Like, and and I felt like at every moment I had to I had to sort of pick what I was, um, and it was you know. So even when you just join, when you become a citizen, there's still a lot more options in the drop down menu of things you have to pick. <laughs> Um, and, you know, one reason why I think that might be useful is that that book might still be useful is that, um, we've lost a lot of that associational life, you know, because mm -hmm. in some ways we're defined less by, you know, the clubs or churches that we belong to and far more by our, our political affiliations now, um, and that may not be the healthiest thing uh, for us. Um, you know, it, it used to be that that people would be concerned if, um, you know, if their child grew up to marry someone of a different faith. Uh, now it's not a big deal. Now people are more concerned if they grow up to marry someone of the opposite party. Um, <laughs> and and um, and I think that is maybe a form of associational life that is not that is not the healthiest. Um, so I would still recommend that book. Um, uh, I, I found it um, sort of endlessly, um, um, not just, you know, well-written and, and entertaining, but just, 
just revelatory, revelatory about this place, perhaps a a foreigner's eyes like like Alexis of Tocqueville um, are are particularly useful to to identify um, some sort of key attributes of a place that the rest of us take for granted. Hmm. And now my last question, I'll let you go. It's very unoriginal. I'm sure you're asked it every day. Um, but what are you reading today? Oh, um, so I'm frequently reading sort of multiple books at once, like something mm -hmm. for pleasure, something that I'm writing about right away, um, something that um, I'm thinking about writing kind of long term. Mm -hmm. So I just finished a book that um, I enjoyed very much. It's called um, City on a Hill, A History of American Exceptionalism. And perhaps it's fitting that I'm saying this um, mm -hmm. to the Reagan Foundation because, of course, um, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, was so famous in part for his his description of um, of America as as a shining city on a hill. Um, and I'm going to um, look up the name of the author. It's um, um, Abram Van Engen, a professor at um, uh, Washington University at St. Louis. Um, and it's an academic press book. It's from Yale University Press. I hadn't read it when it came out a couple of years ago. I was utterly fascinated by it because it's a deep excavation of the original John Winthrop sermon, um, a model of Christian charity that, of course, is where the city on a hill um, line, which is from from the Gospel of Matthew, um, but but where, you know, sort of Reagan and many other politicians drew from for um, for that line, uh, Reagan enhanced it, made the city uh, shining. Um, <laughs> and um, what I love about the book is that it's it's clearly a, like a labor of love. It's something that this writer and this this academic has been thinking about for a long time because it tells you the story of the sermon itself and how it was lost for hundreds of years. It wasn't published or thought about um, or cited. And then thanks to the creation of historical societies and antiquarian groups, it started coming back. And then how it sort of went into the academy and then how it shifted into into the political world um, with Kennedy and LBJ, um, who cited it a few times, but then really with with Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Um, and so what I like about it is that it takes something that you think you know uh, well, but in fact um, tells you a whole other story about it um, that 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 I didn't know. So City on a Hill, A History of American Exceptionalism is a book that I would recommend uh, very much. That's a great way to end this. <laughs> um, I want to remind everyone to get a copy of the Washington book. If you purchase it through the Reagan Foundation's website, it's signed by Carlos, so an added bonus. I uh, want to thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it and wish you all the success with this book. Thank you so much. These were great questions and a great conversation. Great. Thank you. You have a good rest of your day. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends, and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.